In 1988, three young melanated girls from the Big Apple began their journey into the music industry. Over the next decade, they would make their mark, resulting in some of the most commercially successful R&B songs of the 1990s. Coco, Taj, and Lili were sisters with voices, or perhaps sisters with vision, since their timeless music is on par with anything out today while simultaneously evoking nostalgia in 90s kids. It was not just SWV's unique sound that contributed to their success, but also their ability to create music that resonated with fans of all ages. Even now, their songs are still staples at social gatherings and serve as the soundtrack to many significant memories. Hello and welcome, or welcome back, to the Awesome Blackness channel. I am the Mighty One, and on this platform, we celebrate the awesomeness of our people. That's right, whether you're big or small, celebrity or civilian, anywhere in the world, if it's awesome, it's featured here. And for this video, we highlight SWV. Cheryl Coco Gamble, Leanne Lily Lyons, and Tamara Taj Johnson share a close bond, having been born within a three-year span in the early 1970s in the Bronx and Brooklyn boroughs of New York. While residing in the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood, Coco crossed paths with Taj, and together they began singing in their local church choir. Their musical journey took a significant turn at the age of 13 when they became regulars at local talent shows. Influenced by the R&B sound of the popular teenage group New Edition, who were adored by young girls at the time, Gamble and Johnson formed their first group, Female Edition, as a tribute to their musical idols. The group slowly began taking shape after Gamble's family moved back to the Bronx. She befriended Lyons. Gamble and Lyons formed a gospel group with other members, while Johnson pursued other endeavors, including attending college for an accounting degree. However, as they transitioned into secular music and members rotated, Johnson rejoined, solidifying the formation of the SWV Quartet at the turn of the decade. That's right, a young girl named Samantha was also part of the group but eventually left, and whose history with the group is otherwise lost to time. Fun fact, before settling on their current name, one suggestion was TLC. This made sense, considering that it was an acronym based on their names. However, this was an idea taken by the Atlanta group by a mere three weeks, as they began their journey around the same time. The girls' journey gained momentum when fate brought them to producer Donald D. Bowden, who guided them in recording demos. Maureen Singleton, their manager at the time, also played a crucial role in promoting their music by sending out tapes along with bottles of Perrier to catch the attention of record executives across America. This luxury water was in lieu of champagne, something they obviously couldn't afford. And the ploy worked. In 1991, SWV's breakthrough came when they were invited to perform live in front of RCA executives, leading to signing an eight-album record deal. Another point to note here is that famous producer Teddy Riley was also instrumental in both getting the group's foot in the door and guiding their sound, which is apparent considering their first album had the new Jack Swing sound. Kenny Ortiz, an executive at the time, saw the trio as the key to breaking into the girl group revival. Consequently, in October 1992, RCA released their debut album, It's About Time, and saw its highest chart position at number two on the Billboard Top R&B Hip Hop Albums chart. Their first single, right here, debuted in the top 20 of the Billboard R&B charts, introducing them to the world and properly laying the foundation for their career. Their success occurred despite mainstream airwaves and the music press paying them little attention. Thus, as a result of radio stations with large black audiences in key markets, their second single, 
I'm So Into You peaked at number two and six, respectively, on the R&B and Hot 100 charts. Despite being admittedly underdogs in the industry, as they weren't signed to a label like Bad Boy, for example, which in hindsight was a good thing for a bunch of reasons, the group quickly became staples in venues focusing on black audiences, making national tours of radio programs and college campuses, as well as the usual concert tours, and appearing before television audiences on many programs, including Showtime at the Apollo, MTV's Fate Black, and BET's Video Soul. By 1993, they had become one of the main attractions of the Budweiser Superfest, the longest-running, most reputable rhythm and blues music festival in the country. SWV earned the fervent adulation of their audience. Young men daydreamed of the trio as one, or all three, of their own. Teenage girls embraced them as role models. Their style of the time, including Coco's long fingernails, became iconic. The songstress recalls that it was night and day how they went from broke and unknown to popularity and prosperity, stemming from their first promo tour. Apropos, it was their third single, a down-tempo and harmonic track, Weak, released in April of 1993, that allowed them to punch through to the upper stratosphere of music, reaching number one on both the R&B and Hot 100 charts by the fall of that year, According to sources, Week reportedly sold 50,000 copies in one day. Despite this track ultimately eclipsing both the preceding singles and topping the charts, it was a remix of their initial single, Right Here, which samples from Michael Jackson's Human Nature from his album Thriller that was their major chart topper. This song is iconic for another reason, as mentioned in a previous video. as it contains the vocal feature from producer Pharrell Williams, chanting a catchphrase that would stay with the group from there on. Packaged with their other hit, the suggestive but empowering Downtown, as a double A side helped them move a half a million units, getting them certified by the RIAA in less than two months. In 2022, 30 years after its initial release, the original version would find new life going gold and then platinum certification on the same day. Along with You're Always On My Mind and Anything, the Divas singles gave It's About Time momentum well into 1994. The album alone earned them 11 Billboard Music Award nominations and became the 16th best-selling album of 1993 in the United States, with 2.1 million copies sold, according to the Nielsen SoundScan. It also earned SWV a nomination for Best New Artist at the 36th Grammy Awards. In 1996, their album was certified three times platinum for shipping over 3 million albums in the United States alone. Also in that time, they would appear on the soundtracks too, Above the Rim and Waiting to Exhale, provide background vocals for Blackstreet's top 40 R&B hit, Tonight's The Night, and release a gold certified EP, The Remixes. New Beginning was the second studio album from SWV, released on the 23rd of April in 1996. A senior editor at All Music noted that, quote, the group does take a different approach on New Beginning, backing away from the new jack grooves that dominated their debut and exploring a more direct, organic R&B vibe, end quote. You're the One became their first single, peaking at number five on the Billboard Hot 100 and number one on the R&B Hip Hop Singles Chart. The second single, Use Your Heart, found Coco known for her distinctively airy, high soprano, and vocal acrobatics, sharing lead singing duties with Taj, who gave a powerful send-off toward the end in her robust and dynamic mezzo-soprano. And, as mentioned in my video on Pharrell, this was the song 
that saw the debut of super producers, the Neptunes, composed of him and Chad Hugo. Another interesting fact about this song that wasn't included before now is the ability to hear the producer-singer himself providing harmonies for the hook, with his presence really evident when he steps out and makes a small ad-lib here. In even deeper lore, Mr. I'll Treat Your Woman Better Than You, Joe, is also pulling background vocal duties. His signature runs can be heard in the fade out of the song's crescendo, but you get a better sense of this on the a cappella version. Lastly, and shout out to an unsung songstress, Tammy Lucas, who was undoubtedly the most instrumental in the song's creation. There is a demo that exists that is sung by her, which I'll link here, and served as the strong foundation upon which the trio built this massively successful and iconic hit. Miss Lucas is due for her flowers, which are coming very soon. All this magic led to the track peaking at number 22 on the Hot 100 and number 6 on the R&B chart. Although this was par for the chorus for the trio, as mentioned in my video on Pharrell, this was his first song to chart. Apropos, the last single, It's All About You, was all about Taj, as she was lead vocalist. New Beginning was certified platinum in September of 1996. The group's third album, Release Some Tension, arrived just over a year later in July of 1997. This effort featured hits like Rain, Someone, Can We, and Lose My Cool, the latter of which being a cancelled single despite a video being shot for it. I was kind of partial to this song, not strictly due to Red Man dropping some bars in two different places on the track, but for his playful singing at the end which I thought was fun. Despite the list of features and production by some of the most hottest beatmakers of the time, the album was only able to certify gold in the United States, and its highest position would be number three, attained on the UK's OCC R&B Albums chart. The girls and others claimed that this album was rushed, and recording began while they were still promoting New Beginning. Nevertheless, Critics stated that the album was solid, even in spite of the head-spinning array of producers and collaborators. A Special Christmas, a holiday album featuring both cover versions and original material, and all three members taking lead vocals on various tracks, was released on the 18th of November, 1997. Though the critics cited it as being respectful and reverent to the classic holiday songs, while also ensuring that the SWV stamp was placed on them, the album only peaked at number 85 on the Billboard R&B Hip Hop charts and remained for two weeks. In their nearly 10-year run, the trio experienced international tours, multiple award nominations, industry demand, and millions in record sales. Despite all of this, in 1998, they were split up. Perhaps due to a combination of the demands of the road in touring, album creation, mismanagement, and essentially three people transitioning from young ladies to fully grown women, they needed a break in order to challenge themselves to develop creatively, independent of one another and essentially hit the reset button, which is precisely what happened. Shortly after SWV disbanded, the members began leading their own lives. <laughs> 